how to take testosterone safely. This video from the outset is only for men on testosterone or considering testosterone replacement. I gave a very strong warning that if a young man who has normal testosterone takes testosterone, even steroids, even minimally takes testosterone, he is at risk for getting shut down permanently and may have to live on testosterone the rest of his life or suffer. So I want that to come right from the beginning. But here we go. The overview of what it looks like to live on testosterone for life is what I'd like to review here. It's the systemic effects of testosterone. There's cosmetic versus health issues. Cosmetic, we look at hair loss, acne, gynecomastia, puffiness, facial edema. Hair loss first. There's genes for this. There's a lot of genetic interplay. The dose of testosterone, the length of time on, the aspect of DHT blockers comes right up, finasteride and dutasteride. There's an interplay with using some of these blocking drugs. For years, men have looked at this, including hair restoration experts, and what it will do to your libido. And if you're on testosterone for libido and energy and fatigue and all these things, and now you're using blockers for the hair, which it may work and slow down the train, is it worth it? I'm leave it to you guys. So it's not just as easy as measuring DHT. I've been doing this for so long for you guys, and I, I don't turn down patients on it. I measure it, I look at it. But in the end, you have to understand, what are you doing it for? What about your hair? Go to a, to a, a hair restoration doctor who can be outstanding for working together. In the end, keep testosterone to a down low. It's gonna be microdosing of testosterone esters obviously, or, or if you're using pellets, or if you're using creams and all these things, you just want to give yourself the lowest effective dose. And with that, when you're not using other steroids, the hair hopefully will not be that bad based on your genes, and you'll move forward. Next, acne. Genes, a lot of genes on the acne with testosterone, not to mention it's going to put you into a secondary puberty, really, and then the sebaceous glands will produce more sebum. And with your genes and the interplay of testosterone, of course, and estrogen and all these things, you'll get different degrees of acne. Here's what you do. Again, keep the doses low. Microdosing is everything. Understand the hygienic aspects and using different soaps and acne preparations that are very mild to moderate. Then it goes more severe. Benzyl peroxide with clindamycin cream is a miracle that we use for mild to moderate acne. Then you have to work with dermatology doctors for things like systemic antibiotics like tetracycline and docucycline. Be very careful. Don't bite in the internet, guys. Don't do it because if you have a reaction to this stuff, you could die if you have some a bad allergic reaction. I've heard of this stuff. It's rare, but it happens. Accutane. I will never give it. Accutane is for severe cystic, pustular, nodular, nasty acne. If you're on testosterone, even a little bit, this stuff can happen. You guys know this is, I, I do, this is my day job. So Ac Accutane is severely liver toxic. You could use it with TRT because TRT itself is not liver toxic. Don't use it with oral steroids. I see it though, guys, rarely. I see guys running oral steroids and Accutane. Do not do it, very dangerous. You have to work with dermatologists. You have to look at LFTs, liver function, and you have to run this stuff with a doctor for a very limited uh, time period. Next, that's the acne. Gynecomastia, two types of gynecomastia. Energizing line from Hawthorne. This stuff is awesome. It's five o'clock in the morning right now. Only way to wake up. Hawthorne is the best product line for men. Hawthorne has an online questionnaire personalized just for men, and it puts together exactly from a perspective of skin type, hair type, even type of underarm deodorant, and personal fragrance just for you. 
and then it's put together and it's delivered to your house personally. Hawthorne is awesome. Any man that's busy has to have these products. So I want you guys to go online, you go to hawthorne.co and use promo code anabolicdoc to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O, promo code anabolic doc. Hawthorne dot C-O, promo code anabolic doc. Gynecomastia, two types of gynecomastia. There's sensational versus masses. Number one, testosterone, not to mention steroids, have never been implicated in causing breast cancer. As a matter of fact, back in the the heyday of production of steroids back from the 1950s into the 70s, Halotest and Masteron and Decadrobin were actually marketed for metastatic breast cancer for women. Unbelievable. But if you have a breast mass, you want to be very, very careful. You want to make sure you go to a surgeon to make sure it's not, God forbid, a malignancy. Next, the, the sensitivity, the sensational gynecomastia, the sensations versus the mass, can be transient and episodic. There's genes, there's dose of TRT. Again, keep the doses low. Microdosing is gonna be key for this. Of course, you can measure ultra-sensitive estradiol. You can look at these things. Be very cautious with utilizing aromatase inhibitors because you guys know I don't like them. And But can they be utilized? They can be very cautiously. Baby doses like 0.25, nothing more than 0.5 milligrams of um, anastrozole. And then it, we need to talk about limited utility because I'm giving everything for you guys in this of, of serums, selective estrogen receptor modulators, tamoxifen, and even raloxifene, which I really don't give because I don't like the side effects, not to mention guys will use them for a sensational gynecomastia for just periods where they're on a low dose of testosterone, lowest we can go. They need testosterone, obviously. Everything else is great, but they run through these periods and they like to use it kind of, I'm just giving everything to you guys. They'll use this stuff very transiently and, and very minimally. And I always worry about that DVT because I've seen it from other guys coming into the practice. So deep venous throat blood, a clot in, in the leg. You gotta be careful with these drugs because women have used these in the past for breast cancer and there's so much interplay and even osteoporosis and all these different things in the bone. These are you, you, by excellent doctors and there's just hypercoagulable effects in some of these drugs. So you gotta be very, very careful. Okay, next, puffiness edema facial, obviously related to the guy goes on testosterone, he's getting water retention. What is it from? It's the estrogenicity of the aspect of testosterone. Diets are really important. Keep the salt down, keep the carbs down, exercise, keep the calories down. Microdosing in the end, small doses of testosterone are better tolerated on a frequency basis, but do you, versus one big hit and one bolus of 200 a week or every two weeks where you're up and down, no one's gonna argue that's not, that's not gonna work for most people. Some guys don't care, but Taking small doses every day or every other day of, of injection of testosterone microdosing, is it worth it? And can you maintain it 30 years later? Um, that's up to you. But that, with the, the puffiness and edema, that's related to the water retention. That's a systemic effect of testosterone itself. It is true that it's the estrogenic, estrogenicity, but is it worth it to live on aromatase inhibitors? Come on, guys, you gotta see this for what it's really worth. It, you're on testosterone, you keep the doses low, and you try to keep the frequency just right. Usually every four to five days, maybe six days a week. Some guys just take a small 100 milligrams every week of testosterone intermuscular, and that works for many, many men. Now, this is the big money, the systemic effects, the heart issues, the health issues. But we start with the CNS. Let's go from the head down. You'll be shut down if you're on testosterone. I said it once, I say it again. If you have underlying mood disorders, if you have any general anxiety, any anxiety at all, any history of panic attacks or depression, guys, being on testosterone, it could exacerbate it. It could also cure it. That's how amazing this is, guys. Is it worth it? You wanna have a great psychiatrist or a great doctor of primary care, family medicine, internist. You're on testosterone for the CNS effects of the sex 
and, and the, the lack of fatigue, which is very interesting for how does testosterone make men feel better with mood and sex? It's the limbic system, guys. It's a limbic stimulator. You gotta understand this stuff. If you have underlying mood disorders, you have to be careful. I've, I've, this is my day job. I'm just helping, wanna help you guys with this. This is not medical advice, it's educational. So limitation of aromatase inhibitors. Some men need baby doses of aromatase inhibitors when they have the right dose of testosterone. Other men hate it because it worsens the mood disorder. Blockers, even DHT blockers for this, for the mood and sex. It's very, very sensitive and fragile, guys, with the CNS. Not to mention, you're going to be shut down with, the, with, with fertility. We're going to cover all that when we hit the testicle here in a little bit. But we start with the head and the CNS effects with the mood disorders. If you have underlying mood disorders, this is going to be so important to work with very good doctors. Sometimes you can use small doses of antidepressants really to balance everything out and get through a, a great life. And there's cognitive behavioral therapy, guys, just the behavioral therapy and talk therapy, putting it all together and just being mindful. Next, cardiovascular. This is where I shine. The cardiac systemic effects of even testosterone. The Fed in 2015 said heart attack, stroke, and death potentially. I'm not for it the Fed or against the Fed, I'm right down the middle. It, there is evidence that it could worsen the heart if you're hypertensive, if your blood pressure is up, that's gonna lead to uh, increased events of, of, of stroke and heart attack. No one's arguing, no one can argue that. I don't care if it's from McDonald's too much or it's from too much testosterone, lipids. So this is gonna be looking for blood pressure and lipids. Monitor your blood pressure. You're on the lowest dose of testosterone, you're getting older, you have hypertension, there's genetics, your diet, the salt, the carbohydrates, the high intensity interval. There's medicines, guys. I hate when, the, when the, some of these YouTubers that otherwise are very bright guys and put out great information, they just globalize and say, take an ACE or ARB, like Losartan, that's cringy. Not everyone could take the same class of drugs. That's why I'm here to help with the app and I'm providing you with further services where you can be able to diagnose and even get treatment for blood pressure. Guys, ACE, A or B, B is beta blocker. I like cardio selective beta blockers. There are several. C is calcium channel blocker, D is diuretic. Guys, four drug classes to, to really properly with an internal medicine doctor, or hopefully with someone like myself helping you really put together after the diet and the exercise, the minimal dose of testosterone. Do you need to get blood pressure medicine, guys? My blood pressure is about 110 over 70s or less than 80 on diastolic. I've been doing it for 20 years. I'm begging you to believe me. This is where the money is. So that's blood pressure. Next is lipid. When you think about heart attacks and these unfortunate circumstances that are happening to steroid users, clearly this is TRT dose, but it still can happen. Even men on no testosterone have heart attacks, and so do women. Genetics, blood pressure, cholesterol, cholesterol, calcium score. Get the calcium score. Be careful with it. It depicts hardened plaque. It doesn't see soft plaque. You have to put together the family history, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, the sugars, the smoking status, your genes everything, testosterone, <clears throat> you have to look at this. There are ways to treat and to stabilize coronary artery plaque with experts like me, with experts like Dr. Nolan, watch the video, how to not have a heart attack part one. There are statins, there's alternative dose statins every other day, it's a secret. There's PCSK9 drugs, there's Vasipa, there's Zadia, there's even other medications. Guys, it is incredible. This is where the money is. In the end of the day, living on testosterone safely is gonna be the heart and the prostate. It's just gonna come down to this. Let's keep going from the heart down. There's no effects directly on the liver unless you're on uh, anabolic steroids, but this is TRT. It, it doesn't affect the kidney adversely unless you're hypertensive or you have diabetes. And then on the liver, there's something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is common on people because they're overweight, they have genes for it, the triglycerides are high, and again, they're pre-diabetic or diabetic, frankly, so that's gonna be looked at. You have to look at that, but it's not testosterone. Testosterone could probably even uh, help manage non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because you, you, if you have with a good diet and exercise on testosterone, it builds muscle and burns fat, and that's good for that visceral fat. 
This is super complicated. Next, guys. Polycythemia, the androgen-induced erythrocytosis, the effects of androgen on the red blood cells. This is a CBC. This is the complete blood cell. This is the hemoglobin hematocrit, and then you have to interplay that with measuring iron studies. Watch my videos. I have many videos on a playlist about this stuff. You have to really monitor. This is what I do directly for my patients now. This is really super important because if you have too much red blood cell production and too much iron, you're going to have a hypercoagulable state potentially with an increased DVTs, pulmonary embolisms, heart attack, and stroke. It's a hypercoagulable state. And on top of it, there's the iron that is super, super hidden. You have to measure the iron levels. And then based on scientific data that we've seen, people don't live long that have high levels of iron that's in their blood. It's called, it's really a secondary scenario here where it's secondary polycythemia from androgens interplaying with your genes. If you have hereditary hemochromatosis genes, I'm seeing it guys, this is really complicated. Sleep apnea, do you need a CPAP, diet, cut the red meat down, look at the liver king. I mean, I'm not putting this guy down. I think this guy's super cool, but he, if he's a young man, he's on androgens, says he's drug free, but he's not, he, but we obviously know he's not. He just has to say that for his business and his family. So he, he, he's Caucasian, he has genes for this stuff, European ancestry, he's on androgen, he's eating all the iron rich foods. I can only imagine what this guy's iron studies look like and what's gonna happen to him, be very careful. Look at the CBC, the hemoglobin hematocrit. Look at the iron studies. Again, all the blood pressure and the cholesterol, C guys, the calcium score, you're putting it all together yourself. You're using my resources, your own resources, you're getting things done. Next, let's drop out of the heart into the pelvis, testicles and prostate, and we're done. Testicles, they will atrophy. This is, this is the interplay of obviously shutting down the hypothalamus pituitary and therefore the gonadal axis. It just is what it is. So you're gonna get testicular atrophy. Thank God there's no testicular cancer, although I saw a study once where with testosterone interplay with IGF, it looked like, I guess that's growth hormone, guys taking growth hormone. I assume it's not natural IGF levels high, but it could have been in some of these limited studies. It's IGF itself or growth hormone. It can increase testicular cancer with testosterone. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. But you got to be careful. Check your testicles. Check your testicles if they're atrophied. But God knows the sex can be great, right? Because it's a central nervous system thing. As long as the cock works great and you're, you're free of disease and nitric oxide and your heart's good, this is so complicated. Fertility, it's a warning. Your testicles are going to be off, but the brain feels good. You're shutting down your testicles. You're bypassing the testicles. You're feeding your testosterone directly to the brain. When you come off to get fertile, we switch right over to HCG, sometimes with Clomid. Watch the fertility videos on that stuff. You want to be very, very careful about fertility because it's sad when guys can't get fertile or they have to come off testosterone and the doctor doesn't know to give HCG. And Clomid usually by itself, that doesn't go well for most guys, although it can for some. So the testicles are going to atrophy. Can you live on testosterone and HCG at the same time? You can. It usually ends up wearing out and you get down regulation. It doesn't work and it's a lot of injections and you can get estrogenic. And then we're talking about all that, the stuff I just talked about with the estrogenicity. So that's the testicle. Make sure you check your testicles. And if you get a mass in there, with the grace of God, go to a urologist. They're going to get an ultrasound. God forbid we have testicular cancer. Now let's wrap up with the prostate. Again, the heart and the prostate, that's really the end game for you guys, and I, I manage it all day long with men, with other doctors, urologists. There's no, thank God, there's no data to state that if you don't have prostate cancer to, when you start testosterone, it will not cause and lead to prostate cancer. As a matter of fact, now there's data that says men on testosterone appear to have a lower incidence of aggressive prostate cancer. That may be secondary to a hypothesis of testosterone saturation model. It's Abraham Morgenthauer, Dr. Morgenthauer over at Harvard. You can Google all the stuff, it's really cool. But you have to be careful. You have to manage PSAs and digital rectal exams. 
I can't do them because my hand's disabled, so I look at PSA levels and I send men to uh, primary care doctors that are very good at the exam or urology doctors. Now, when it comes to DHT blockade, kind of like the hair, using finasteride and dutasteride, that's more for BPH for older men that, ha that are at risk for having obstructive prostate conditions where they get uroseptic and their prostates are just huge and super large and they can get obstructed and get uroseptic and sick in the hospital. That's what that's used for, but it's gonna wreck the sex drive. So is it worth it? There's no data to state that you can take DHT blockers on testosterone and be protected from prostate cancer. And there's no data for that. You wanna be, be careful with that because you're giving stimulation to the brain for sex and well being, and then you're blocking that DHT because those are DHT receptors, either for the hair or here for the prostate. And it's, you, it's not done, rarely done, and you just have to be careful. Now, next, dose for the prostate. You want to keep the doses low for the no brainer that if you're, you don't want to have BPH in a large prostate, so it's cancer versus BPH in a large prostate. It's very difficult for any doctor to differentiate. You're going to use digital rectal exams. You're going to use PSA. You look at family history. If you've got a family history of prostate cancer, you're going to want to be more vigilant. And then you want to use lowest dose of testosterone. You're going to want to really, really check. Um, to make sure you don't have too much free testosterone because that's what's going to be stimulating, converting to DHT, not to mention, and even estrogen. I'll close on this point. We don't know that the increase in estrogen, like a natural man who's older, who's natural, that has lower testosterone, higher estrogen, is that what causes BPH, the enlarged prostate, and then the suffering that comes with an enlarged prostate. That's not cancer, though, but it's still suffering. Does aromatase inhibitors play a role for that? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think taking the lowest dose of testosterone, keeping it on a frequency to keep it sustained into the brain so you feel great, managing all these risks that I just laid out for you guys, one by one, piece by piece, you have to do it yourself with your caregiver. I'm here to help with these videos. It's educational and the app. And then also we have more resources for you. Guys, I want a lot of I want a lot of comments. Every man, men come here to get this guide in the breakdown educationally, and then they read the comments. And I tell you, the comments, guys, are equally as good as the videos, I think, here. I think together we make a great team. I want to thank you, guys, gentlemen in the world, all the world, for trusting me for this educational information. We're strong. We're cruising through life. I'm 57. I'm tired, guys, but you know, only because I'm working my ass off and I feel great. And I really want to thank you if this helps men in the world to stay strong and healthy. Thank you so much.